Hi everyone, good evening. My name is Tasman Cordy, and some of you are very familiar to me for the last five years since I've worked with this office, and some of you are brand new, partly because I'm only there on Thursday, uh, Thursday afternoon, so I miss a lot of people now. Used to be. But um, we're glad you're all here tonight. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed your dinner. We're kind of halfway-ish done with dinner. Uh, and this is the best part because um, if you haven't been to one of our dinner um, dinner lectures or um, events like this in the past, you're really lucky because Dr. Larry probably has the best message about chiropractic and about what we get to do in our practice on a day-to-day -day basis that you'll ever hear. And all of the five of us um, doctors in this office have about like 120 something years of experience combined. And this practice is adjusted somewhere around 350,000 people and thousand adjustments, which is such a huge, amazing number in like the almost 20 years it's been in existence. And so we're glad you're here tonight to continue what we get to do on a daily basis. And we're really lucky to have such a cool crowd and um, and such a grateful um, such a grateful bunch of patients we get to take care of every day and every week and every month we show up to work and show up to practice and show up to our lives for you. Um, if you haven't been here before, raise your hand for me. I just want to see who what percentage we have here. Okay, good. It's like fifty fifty. And then if you have been here before, raise your hand. Way less. So when Dr. Larry repeats all of his jokes, you still have to laugh. <laughs> and don't worry, they're good this year again, I promise. <laughs> um, Dr. Um, Dr. Larry Bregman has been in practice for over 20 years. He is, um, this practice is just less than, just less than that. And um, he has taught and lectured around the country. He teaches the technique that we do in the office the upper cervical technique that we do in the office to other doctors and students, and he's done this for years. A lot of what you'll learn tonight is founded in the, the book that if you're a guest, you receive tonight, and if you want another copy, if you haven't read it for a long time, or you've forgotten what's in it, you're welcome to one. And um, the book that he wrote with another upper cervical chiropractor, and a lot of the philosophy or the understanding about how we work and what we do We'll talk a bit about tonight, but definitely if you're more interested in the, the greater work behind what we do, it's definitely in the book that we have for you. And if you um, have any questions for any of either um, the doctors or the staff, we'll be here after the talk is done tonight. And we're happy to answer any questions about how care works in the office and what that looks like. And, um, and we'd like to make sure that we get everything, um, everything answered before you before you walk out because sometimes you think about things when you're here in a space like this that you sort of completely, um, completely you forget about after you leave. And so I wanna make sure that whatever you have that you're here tonight, like make a note of it and find one of us because there's seven of us here tonight and we can all answer all of your questions, I promise. We have great staff and we have just the best doctors I could ever ask to work with, even though I only get to work with them once a week. So um, I would like to introduce again, Dr. Larry Arbeitman. Thank you so much for being here tonight with me and with us. And um, I'm gonna let him have the floor. Remember that applause. We're gonna do that again later, okay? <laughs> oh, the hardest part's over, waiting. Thank you for allowing me to share my passion with all of you. Um, your motivations become our motivations. We are a heart first practice. And many people when they come to these presentations will wanna know how do we work with your team and we'll let you know that. But even if we never see you in the office, I promise the information and the inspiration I'm gonna share with you can have a massive impact on, on your health, your life. Maybe maybe there's maybe this talk is for somebody who's not here. Maybe somebody at home, maybe somebody in your family um, that you'll be able to bring this information back to. So a couple housekeeping things here. We need everybody in this front row to turn and face me because when I see this for 30 minutes, <laughs> 
gives me a subluxation. <laughs> We only get one spine in this life. Let's take care of it, right? All right, question time, question and answer time. By a show of hands, how many people here want to be healthy and happy? Raise your hand. All right, so we all have something in common. Now, by a show of hands, how many people have a birthday? <laughs> okay, we have that in common. By a show of hands, how many people's birthday is today? Okay, so if it's not your birthday, I want you to go onto your phone and shut your ringer off. That way we know if your phone rings in the middle of my talk, we're all going to turn and sing happy birthday to you. <laughs> so you may be asking yourself a question, why a chiropractor? Why a dinner? I mean, by a show of hands, how many of your interns have taken you out to dinner to talk to you about your health? Okay. What I realized um, very early in my career was, uh, Sam, can you just turn my volume down just a pinch? Okay. Can't hear myself think. Um, what I realized very early in my career was that there's a big gap or a chasm between what we do as chiropractors and what the public and the community think we do. And I remember when I was considering becoming a chiropractor, I was speaking to one, and I said, doesn't it frustrate you that people don't really know what you do? They think you take care of bad backs and bad necks? And he said, no, I love it. That means I got a job to educate the community. And so when I heard that, I said, I've got to become a very good educator, and we've been doing community outreach events like this, because if you ask people, what does a chiropractor do? They're gonna say twist necks, crack backs, and you know, that thing on YouTube or Facebook, you know? And that's like so dangerous for our profession because that doesn't put it in a good light. And so one of my early missions was to change the public's perception of chiropractic. And I think we're doing a pretty good job at that. And we've gotta do, I always tell the team, we've gotta do it best, better than the best. We've gotta be the best of the best of the best because I believe that the public perception of chiropractic isn't as high as it should be, it's getting better. And so hopefully tonight that's gonna to start to shift some things in, in your mind. You know, there are some, some uh, new patients here that we've just met in the past few months. Thank you for being here. And then there's some of our old guard here. Um, Holly and Jimmy back there, right? Um, yes, miss, you, miss Linda, all right, let me tell you a quick story. So it's May 1st, 2005. I'm going to open my practice up the next day, Monday. I have no patients, zero patients. So I go to the free old mall with my spine and a table. Um, I wasn't trespassing, I actually rented the space. And um, I stood out there. Because I knew I had something good to give to humanity. I knew I had something good to give to humanity. I just had to meet people. And this woman walks by with her friend, and I tell her who I am and what we do, and I invite her into our practice the next day for an evaluation. And we actually had four people come in the next day, and I called my mom that night. I actually didn't have to call her because I was living there. <laughs> I called her from downstairs. I said, Ma, I need somebody behind the front desk. And so my mom came in and worked behind the front desk. And uh, Linda was patient number one. Whoa. And so every May 2nd, Linda and I share our anniversary. We just, we just shared it. And last year, our event was on May 2nd, and Linda was kind enough to share uh, her, her, her story with everybody. So um, tonight, we're going to talk about health. We're going to talk about healing. We're going to talk about what we actually do in our office. And for, I'm also going to give you what I believe to be the greatest opportunity in healthcare. Because upper cervical care shouldn't be a secret. It shouldn't be a secret. When I came out of school in 2003, there were only three upper cervical doctors in New Jersey and none in Monmouth, Middlesex, or Ocean County. It just didn't exist. Thankfully, there's, there's more now. Um, so I believe we save lives 
in our office every day with the chiropractic adjustment. And some of you may think that's a really bold statement, and it is. But we don't save lives like uh, the ER doctors do. Like, God forbid there was an accident out there on Route 34 and someone's arm is dismembered and there's blood coming out. You're going to bring him in here and I'm going to adjust him and their arm's going to reattach. That's not how we save lives. God bless. God bless. He's done the truth. Um, there was a dinner like this, and I always start off these events with this story because it's grounding for me. There was a dinner like this, and at this point it's probably about 12, 13, 14 years ago. And uh, Pat, the mother of Stephanie, gets up to tell her daughter's story of health and healing. Stephanie, at the time when I met her, was a, um, a junior at Freehold Township High School. She was a varsity gymnast, she was an A student, and her mother called the office, and my mom wasn't working that day, so I answered. <laughs> and she begins to tell me that her daughter was out to the movies with her friends and went paralyzed from the neck down, could not move her body. And they rushed her up to Robert Wood Johnson. Her movements started to come back, but she was left with such pain and chronic fatigue that she literally could not go to school. She was out of gymnastics for a year. And they went to the biggest and best in Park Avenue. They took her down to CHOP in Philadelphia. And they took her to the rheumatologist and the orthopedic and the neurologist and the immunologist. And finally they said, we can't find anything wrong. It must be in her head. Go take her to a psychiatrist. <laughs> and that's when the mother out of desperation reached out to our office. And typically that's how it goes, right? Like people try everything first. Like all those doctors, then the school nurse, then the puppy groomer, and then they call the chiropractor. <laughs> it's changing, but I can make a joke about it. Um, so I said to the mom, bring her in, let me evaluate her. And we started taking care of Stephanie. And I said to the mom, Pat, I said, you know, there was a moment where she was healthy. I think I'm making noise. Just the jacket, guys. <laughs> um, I said to Pat, there was a moment your daughter was healthy and there was a moment that she wasn't functioning right. And if there's any pressure on her central nervous system and we detect that and we correct that, there's no telling what can happen. See, because as doctors, we don't heal people. I got a secret for you. None of your doctors heal you. None of us can heal. The only person that can heal is you. And the only, the, the definition of a healer is the person that's with the person at the time that they heal. Okay? So we start taking care of Stephanie, and it's not like she just got her health back, like we adjusted her, she said, I'm going back to school. No, it was, that's not how these vegetables or herbs come up in his garden out there. It, life is a process. And so very slowly, we start, kept taking pressure off of Stephanie's nervous system. And I remember when she was able to start to go into school for a half day, and then a full day. And then she went into the gym and just watched her friends compete. And then she had enough strength, this is over months, to get onto the mat and to, and to do some tumbling. And then I'll never forget the day she busted open the front door. She said, Dr. Larry, I did giants. Who knows what giants are? That's when they go, <laughs> So Stephanie goes on to graduate high school. She, go, she goes on to Seton Hall. She becomes a speech therapist. And she ends up marrying Ronan. And on the day of her wedding, she comes into her office. She comes down to an album. She lives in Jersey City. She picks up her dress. She gets her adjustment. And she goes off and gets married. Wow. And I was a new practitioner in the beginning. And I heard all these stories about the miracles that chiropractic has become famous for, upper cervical has become famous for, but that was the first one that I saw, that I witnessed. And then every day what motivates me, what motivated me to come here tonight is how many Stephanies are in this room right now? Or how many Stephanies do you know outside of this room? And the sweetest part of this whole story is that last year we started adjusting her daughter. Wait. Yeah. How old is your daughter? A baby. Uh, she had a baby. I know. But so, um, this is this, this is a, oh, oh, why did we adjust the baby? Hold that thought. Why would you ever adjust a baby? Hold that thought. We're gonna, we're gonna circle back to that. See what I'm saying? There's a big gap between what we do as chiropractors and what the public thinks we do. I'm gonna handle that. I promise you. <laughs> 
What happens if Stephanie doesn't find that care? Does she ever graduate high school? Does she ever go to college? Does she ever meet Ronan? Does she ever have a baby? Or is she under her parents' care forever? I don't know. I can't know what, we, what was prevented. There's another way we save lives. Everybody familiar with the opioid epidemic that has not ended yet? Right. Okay, here's some crazy statistics. I look it up every year and every year it goes up even though they knew, they knew it was addictive. Mm -hmm. 422,000 Americans from, from 2011 to 2021, 10 years died. That's a lot more than the Vietnam War, like five times as much. From 20 years old to 39 years old, it's 21% of deaths. One in five people who die between the ages of 20 and 39 are dying from opioids. And one in 21 Americans during the year 2021 died from an opioid overdose. During the pandemic, it went up during the pandemic. I'm very proud to say that we don't have any patients, and we have hundreds of patients in our practice taking opioids. And how many of those 350,000 adjustments that we did, did we prevent people from going down that road? And what about those 422,000 people if they ended up in an office like ours with that information from their doctors? Or maybe people come to our practice on opioids and they're able to get off. Or maybe because they're patients and they hear our teaching that they choose a different way. We save lives every day in our office. It should be the first point of entry into the healthcare system. Is it a healthcare system? That's another question. Everybody said they want to be healthy. How do we define health? You got to know what it is if we're going to get it. I bet you if I walked around the room and put people on the spot, which I will never do, and say, well, how, how do you know if you're healthy? How do you know if you're healthy? We'll have 70 different answers. And some are going to be spot on and some are going to be way off. Here's some of the ones that I hear. Well, if I feel good, I'm healthy. But I have the chuckles. But some people believe that. Cancers, heart disease, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, AIDS. These are symptomless diseases that kill people all the time. We all know somebody who felt good until they got a diagnosis and then they felt bad. In fact, that's why people go for early detection. But that's not preventative care. Going for a mammogram and a prostate exam isn't preventative care. It's just early detection, which has a ton of value. But what, how do we prevent that from even happening? The other thing that I usually hear is, well, if I'm not sick, I'm healthy. Another chuckle. Well, would you rather be pretty or just not ugly? <laughs> Smart or just not dumb? Rich or just not poor? Would you rather be healthy or just not sick? Because the thing that's obvious, if wellness is here and illness is here, if we're alive, we're on this continuum somewhere. What's less obvious to people is each and every day, whether you like it or not, we're either moving one way or another because nothing alive is staying static. <laughs> Look at your pictures from five years ago, right? <laughs> So we can be taking daily action steps, having a game plan, a strategy, a team in place, a direction to move us towards wellness. And if we're doing nothing, if we're staying between symptom, not sick, symptom, not sick, that's, that's the healthcare system. That's the sick care system. How many people call their doctor and say, I feel good, I'd like to come in today. <laughs> they laugh you off the phone. If you can even see a doctor anymore, right? <laughs> PAs, NPs, right? So don't get me wrong. We need a healthcare system. We need this system that we have. I just think we gotta know when to go in and when not to go in. You know, if, if put it this, well, let's go back to health before I go into the system. If it's not about how I feel, and it's not about being not sick, Dr. Larry, then what is health? Well, if you ask the dictionary, health is a complete state of mental, physical, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and or infirmity. Nowhere in that definition from Dorland's Medical Dictionary is anything about feeling good. I don't think, a by a show of hands, how many people have a complete state of mental, physical, and social well-being? It's this kind of like utopia definition. And there's different levels of health, right? Like thank God we all have a higher level of health than the people in the hospital right now. 
And health is all like education. We all have a higher level of education than we did a moment ago. No, than most, <laughs> than, than a lot of people in the world. Could we be more educated? Yes. Could we be healthier? Yes. So when your children were born, did you leave their education to happenstance? Like, let's just see how it goes. We'll just kind of wing it. No, you've got a plan. You've got a plan. You, got, you know when they're going to pre-K and kindergarten and do the lower L and upper L, and we're going to plan for their, 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 their education. Are we planning for our health that way? Going for a blood test once a year or once every six months, I'm going to tell you, you're going to fall short. Who's responsible for your health? Not the red, white, and blue Medicare card? <laughs> not your insurance company? Not your doctor? No, you are. You are responsible for your health. And if you think about your, and I want to applaud all of you for being here tonight, right? You, just, you took a step. Like you could have been home watching Netflix. The Knicks are playing tonight. <laughs> you wanted to see the Knicks game, right? <laughs> Me too. But this is more important. We have to have a plan. We have to have a plan. Your health affects every aspect of your life. It is your greatest asset. Without your physical health, you can't do the things you want to do. Many people want to garden this time of year, go on vacations, be able to walk out onto the soccer field. Without your, without your health, you don't have your emotional health. How you show up, your disposition every day is slanted when you don't have your health. Without your health, you don't have financial health. You know what's expensive in this country? Getting sick. We can't afford to get sick. Half of all bankruptcies in this country are due to medical expenses. And this is a Harvard study. Half of those are college educated people because it doesn't care about socioeconomic status. We have to have a strategy in place. You have to have doctors that are trained in health and wellness and what people live from, not just sickness, disease, and what people die from. You need both. So if a house was on fire, who would you call? Fireman. The fire department, of course. And the fire department, if they get there in time with your axes and their hoses, that's a metaphor for drugs and surgery, they break through your front door, they break through your living room, they take your hoses out, they hose down your kitchen living room, your Apple computer, your TV, your refrigerator, and if they get there in time with their axes and their hoses, they can save your house, thank God. We have fire departments. But the next day when the fire is put out, who do you call? Do you call the fire department back and say, can I have more axes and hoses, please? No, who do you call? The insurance company who's gonna line you up with a general contractor. And so the general contractor doesn't have axes and hoses. They've got like nail guns and ladders and paintbrushes. And so the fire department who's trained in that sickness, illness and, and what people die from mentality, they look at the, uh, the general contractors and they're saying, that's ridiculous. You can't put out a fire with a, with a paintbrush and a nail gun. And we say, we're not trying to put out fires. These houses aren't spontaneously combusting. We want to get into the house early, teach the homeowner how to check the roof, how to check the foundation, make sure the electrical wiring is right, make sure the plumbing is cool, have a plan. So there are so many people that are falling off the cliff that the fire department can't even keep up. They don't have the training, knowledge, time, energy, resources to see how, why they're falling off the top of the cliff. They're just creating the chemistry and the surgeries. And thank God, if, if the stuff hit the fan, there's no better place that I'd want to be in this planet than here. But I'm not going into the sick care system to get healthy. Uh-uh, ain't happening. As a country, are we getting healthier or sicker? I've been doing this talk presentation for 21 years. The answer hasn't changed. How many people here believe they could be healthier five years from now? Like, like is it a possibility? Yeah. Yeah. That's an important belief system to have. Without that belief system in place, because some people, we hear, doctors hear, oh, I'm just getting older. That's a dangerous belief system because that will come true. How many people are healthier today than they were five years ago? 
Yes. Excellent, excellent. And if I ask them, and again, I don't put people on the spot, what did you do to become healthier five years? They'd say, um, I started a new diet, I started intermittent fasting, I started to exercise, I found this great chiropractic team in Marlboro, <laughs> I, I got rid of that job, I got rid of that relationship, I quit that, that addiction. Don't you see that health is a shedding? It's not always an adding on. But no one ever says, oh, I had this great surgery or got this great drug. There's 20,000 drugs approved by the FDA right now for marketing, 20,000, and we consume 30% in this country. You would think if better health came from better chemistry, we'd be the healthiest in the world. So I went on to Dr. Google, and I said, what are the healthiest countries in the world? And, I, and it said to me, how do you want to know? And I said, well, life expectancy. So how many people think the United States is in the top 10 in life expectancy? No, no, no. Top 20? No. no. 30? No. 40? No. We are 46 no. behind Estonia, Poland, Cuba. We have the most money going to medical research. We've got the biggest and brightest doctors in the system. We've got these gigantic hospitals and institutions. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And what do the people get? Sicker, 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 sicker and sicker. So maybe there's just another way. Maybe it's not better health through chemistry. Maybe it's better health through lifestyle. Don't get me wrong. I like dessert, but I also like to move my body, right? So your health affects everything that you do. Um, God, I can read you more statistics, but I'm not going to. So we're responsible. Your health impacts your quality of life. Your quality of life depends on your health. Your, your mission, like at the end of the day, we're, we're all gonna be leaving here one day. And you're gonna be looking back on your life and you're gonna say, was I able to do everything that I was set out to do in my life? The relationships, your relationships with, 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 with your friends. I've had patients with migraines that, that haven't been on a social plan in years. Um, your relationship with your lover or your significant other suffers when you don't have your health, your relationship with your kids or your grandkids, we need to prioritize this. You, you want to know people's value system? Look at their credit card statement. Look at their credit card statement. What are you investing in? I, got, I asked a veteran, the, a, a veteran was wearing a, 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 Korea, a Korean War hat, and I always thank veterans, and I said, thank you, sir, for your service, and he said, you're worth it. Aww. You're worth it! I'm granting you permission to take better care of yourself tomorrow, today, tomorrow. So for those of you who have made changes, notice your gains. You know, don't be measuring yourself against this ideal. That's the problem with social media, right? Like you see this ideal. Look at where you were and where you are now and measure yourself with your gains. Measure yourself backwards. You'll feel better. Every day you'll gain confidence. So what happens is somebody eats a bagel or a donut and they get completely derailed, right? But you could follow that up with a, with a healthy lunch or a workout or a meditation, and that's what you can focus on. That's a victory. So now that we define health and what it's not and what it is, let's talk about healing because I do believe that we are experts in our office in healing. Not because we heal people, but because we've witnessed many people healing. We have a part of our staff meeting every Monday called our Magic Moments. We start out every meeting with the Magic Moments from the week before. There isn't a week that goes by that we're not celebrating some sort of miracle in our office. It's incredible. We're humbled by that. We're humbled by this work. And that's why, um, God, if you had just seen what I've seen over the last 20 years of these gentlemen, 30, 35 years, you'd be up here doing the talk. And God knows Linda and Holly, they could do the talk by now, right? <laughs> so healing is an inside out process. It's a universal law. What's a universal law? A universal law is a law, whether you believe in it or not, anywhere on this planet, it's a law, and I'll give you an example of a universal law. Gravity. Whether you believe in gravity or not, if you jump off a building in New Jersey, New Zealand, or New Mexico, you're going down. 
<laughs> you know, at this point in my talk, there's no rabbit in here. <laughs> I take out my keys. It used to be keys, now it's a key fob. <laughs> Dr. Larry, if healing is a universal law and we're designed to heal, then why are so many people suffering? Why am I suffering? Why isn't this key falling? You can interfere with the law. Why aren't the planes falling out of the sky? We figured out how to interfere with the law of gravity. And so we could be interfering with our body's own natural ability to take care of itself, to heal and regulate itself. Remember how I said that, you know, so many people are like, when, when the stuff hits the fan, they're looking to put things in. Put things in, take things on. And I'm gonna tell you, the work is inside out. It's always inside out. It's like a hot air balloon. You gotta start dumping weight. You gotta start dumping weight. I don't mean physical weight, and sometimes that's the issue, but just the stuff that you don't need, the stuff that is keeping your body from healing. And I know a major one. I'm gonna teach you chiropractic in four sentences, that's it. The human body is self-healing and self-regulating. Has anybody ever cut their skin? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did the other day with a, with a straight edge right here on my thumb. What made new skin? The Band-Aid? No, the Neosporin, like the, like the commercial. It just made the skin. Or broken a bone. What makes new bone? Your body does. Now, sometimes we need an assist, like even the best surgery. If the doctor pins and plates the broken bone and brings it together, what does he or she say to the family? The surgery went well, your loved one's okay, now we gotta see how they heal. Because the, doc, the surgeons know they don't heal anybody. They can only set up the body to heal itself properly. That's why when you don't you know, set a broken bone, it doesn't heal properly. So the nervous system is self-healing and self-regulating. If something was interfering, the nervous system controls and coordinates every organ, cell, and tissue of the body. If you don't believe me, take your fork and start poking it around. Anywhere you feel the fork is a nerve. If I took Dr. Miola's hair, skin, bones, muscles away, you'd still see the outline of his body here because his nervous system is everywhere. What system of the body controls the entire body? the brain and the spinal cord. It's the central nervous system. It's not the cardiac system. It's not your immune system. It's not your respiratory system. It's not your reproductive system. It's the brain and the spinal cord. Your spinal cord is your lifeline. It is your mind-body connection. If something was interfering with the communication down this line, would we be healthy or sicker? Every time. Would we heal well or not as well? Every time. Chiropractors, upper cervical chiropractors, remove nerve interference at the highest point, at the brain stem, where the brain meets the spinal cord. This is the main switch. I'll give you an example, Christopher Reeves. Christopher Reeves severed C2 spinal cord and the communication couldn't get from his brain to his body. Did he have headaches and neck pain? No, the whole body shut down. In fact, we know he tragically lost his life earlier than he should have because life couldn't flow. What if somebody you loved had a misalignment in the upper neck in the same area of Christopher Reeves, but to one one hundredth of a degree, but it was enough to put pressure or attractioning on the brain stem, do you think it could affect their legs? Do you think it could affect their lungs? Do you think it could affect the way that they move? Do you think it could affect the way that they heal? Do you think that it could affect the way they perceive our environment, their environment? Because the nervous, you're living your life in your nervous system. Who's thinking about digesting their eggplant rollatini right now? Raise your hand. None of you, because it's being done for you. It's automated. The first automation. And we call that system the autonomic nervous system your blood pressure, your libido, your immune system, your respiratory system, your cholesterol is all controlled by the autonomic nervous system. What's the purpose of the nervous system? It's to help us adapt. So I came in here today and I was hot. So I asked Mike, who, by the way, 
come back for dinner. This place is amazing. Um, and eat outside. They do an amazing job. I asked Mike to put the, the, the air conditioning on. Your body has that same mechanism. It will help you adapt to stress. So in chiropractic, we call this nervous system interference a subluxation. Who's heard of that word before tonight? Raise your hand. Only the patients, oh my God. Sub meaning less, lux meaning light, less light. So a subluxation is a chiropractic $5 word for stress. By a show of hands, does anybody have stress in this room? <laughs> stress comes in three forms, physical, chemical, and emotional. None of you have physical stress because you all work out five days a week. You have a Pilates reformer in your living room and your trainer, Ralph, comes over every other day. And you never sit at a workstation looking down at your phone, right? Chemical stress. Do we live in New Jersey and breathe the clean New Jersey air and drink the clean New Jersey water and we're never exposed to any chemicals, insecticides, or pesticides, right? Or medications prescribed or not prescribed. And what about emotional stress? Are you married? <laughs> so we just came through one of the most stressful periods in our lifetimes with the pandemic. And we saw when it, the ripple effect hasn't ended, by the way. I mean, this is why it still takes six to nine months to see a specialist. By the way, if you're in crisis, we won't make you wait six to nine months. As busy as we are, we will get to you. We will get to all of you. We never closed the office during the pandemic. We knew that our patient stress levels were maxed out. And if there was ever gonna be interference in their nervous system, if there was ever gonna be subluxation, it was gonna be from 2020 to 2022. And we never closed it. Why do you become a fireman or firewoman and then close your office when the fires, the houses are burning? Mm. So we showed up because it was either us or the emergency room, right? For a lot of patients. Proud of that. So 90% of health challenges are due to chronic stress, according to the CDC. So when your body goes into a stressful situation, has anybody heard of the term fight or flight? Yes. That's your autonomic nervous system. And what does it do? It gets you ready to fight or run. So what are some of the normal physiological responses by a healthy nervous system that's in a stressful situation? Your, the muscles tighten, the heartbeat goes up, the blood pressure goes up, focus gets really narrowed. There's no memory, you don't need to remember anything in that moment. Digestive system empties out and then slows down. There's no libido, because when you're in stress mode and you're fighting a tiger, you don't need a libido. Um, muscles tighten, blood pressure goes up, cholesterol goes up, sugar goes up, because you need cholesterol, fat, and sugar in your bloodstream to mobilize. Don't you see that the chronic conditions Diabetes, high, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, arrhythmias, fibromyalgia, those are all normal stress responses. And when the stress response is on for a short period of time, like a workout or a game, and then it goes back off, that's when we get stronger, we grow from that stress. But when that stress never gets shut off, week in and week out, it is catabolic and it is deadly. It will break you down and that will age you. And you'll blame the age, but you won't blame the life spot style stress. So we have to have coping mechanisms. None of us are immune to it. The other side of the nervous system is the healing side, the growth and repair side. It's called your parasympathetic nervous system. It's the relaxed feeling you have after maybe a massage, a meditation, um, a yoga class, a good meal. That's where we're supposed to be operating from, and the fight or flight's only supposed to kick on in times of stress, but it's upside down and backwards for us in our culture. Maybe that's why we're number 46. So the upper cervical adjustment is the safest, gentlest, and most effective way that I know to shut off the stress response. Why? Because there's a little nerve here called your vagus nerve. Anybody ever hear that? It goes every, not Las Vegas. <laughs> it goes everywhere. And it, if I took my heart out and put it on the table, it would be beating at 120 beats per minute. It's my vagus nerve that keeps it down at 50 to 60. So when your nervous system isn't keeping things in check, 
That's when your blood work goes off. And what do you get? Prescription. Right. That's the system. Nobody gets well that way. Now, don't mishear me. Don't stop taking your medication. You have to earn the right to not take those meds. You gotta do the work. Look, some, some people do the work, some people don't. It's a lot easier to not do the work and take the pill. Some things are hard easy, right? And some things are easy hard. And some things are easy easy. So it depends how you, you define the meaning. You give it the meaning. So let's talk about upper cervical care. What is this upper cervical care? And, and why would you ever adjust a baby? Oh my God. So what's really unique about the upper cervical spine is you have this bone up there called the atlas. It's named after the Greek god that held up the world. It holds up your world. And what's really unique about the atlas is it doesn't have a disc above or below, like those soft cartilage pads that they generate. And it spins on C2, which is the axis. And your brain stem is here, your reptilian brain that controls all your functions subconsciously. And major blood flow, those little elastic bands are your vertebral arteries, major blood flow to your brain. And your brain isn't just telling the body what to do, it's actually more of a receiver, like the thermostat, like I felt hot. Mike, can you turn the AC on? Your brain is getting 11 trillion bits of information per second. And then it's deciding what to do with that and then sending it out. So if this area of the spine is misaligned or subluxated and it's putting pressure on the brain stem, it affects three things. Neurological relay between the brain and the body. We have PET scans and functional MRI to show that after an alignment, the brain works more efficiently. It affects blood flow to and fro, and it also affects the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. It is the most important area of our body to have checked. And what I wanted to know early on in my career is how can I make the greatest impact on human health with the least amount of effort? And so I had played football in the 90s from an elephant high school. And back in the 90s, we were taught to hit with our heads, meaning the coach would say, lead with your helmet, put your face mask right in between his two numbers. And whoever had more scuffs on their helmet got more playing time. And my neck was never right after that. And I was at the University of Maryland doing my undergraduate, and I, I fell in love with the philosophy that I'm teaching you tonight, that the body can heal itself without putting anything in and taking anything out. And I went down to this chiropractic school called Life University in Atlanta, and right away I got under care with my first quarter professor, and he was doing this traditional chiropractic technique, which for me made everything worse. I wasn't getting well, and I thought I made a really bad decision. I was gonna drop out of chiropractic school, it was close. I was calling home every day, I gotta change, I gotta make a change, I gotta make a change, I gotta make a change. And I'm telling this story to one of my classmates, she goes, whoa, before you do anything, go listen to this doctor speak on campus, he's an upper cervical doctor, and I said, what's that? And I went on a Wednesday night, very similar to this, and that doctor didn't speak. He brought six patients who told these incredible stories. But I was from Jersey, I was skeptical. I said, yeah, prove it to me, you know? <laughs> so I go in as a patient, and for me, when I got my upper neck corrected with the upper cervical technique, which was super precise and super gentle, for me, it was a very spiritual event. I felt right for the first time since I graduated high school. And I knew that that's what I was meant to be doing. And I begged that doctor, can I just shadow you? And I went there every Tuesday for three years. And he was seeing patients from all over the world. He still does. He's, and, and here we are now, 21 years later, 350,000 adjustments, 15 doctors uh, trained through my office. And I still don't know who told me to go to that talk that day. And she doesn't know how many thousands of lives she saved by sharing that information with me. So I wanna thank and acknowledge the patients who are here tonight that had the courage to reach out to their friend, to their family and say, hey, come to this dinner. I think it may help you. That's a courage. Thank you, thank you. We may have the next upper cervical doctor in the room that we don't even know yet. Evan, it's not too late. <laughs> But you laugh, but we did a dinner like this about eight or nine years ago, 
and a woman came up to me and said, my son is a student at Monmouth. He's studying to go to med school. Can he come shadow you? And I'm like, why does he want to shadow me? He wants to go to med school. And long story short, he's a chiropractor now in Wisconsin. So you never know how far reaching something you say or do for somebody today will affect the lives of thousands of people tomorrow. So that's why we're here tonight. So the upper cervical adjustment is a misnomer. Even though it's done through the upper neck, it's not a neck adjustment. It's a nervous system adjustment. If your doctor gives you a shot of medicine in your butt, he's not a butt doctor. <laughs> <laughs> the medicine goes everywhere. And we have to stop thinking of ourselves in parts. So this is what happens, ladies and gentlemen. When would we get our first misalignment? Anybody want to guess of our upper neck? Birth. 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 Anybody ever been to a birth? <laughs> Once. My wife, we had a doula, and we had like the peppermint, and the snacks, and the ball, and the yoga music, and all this stuff. She didn't use any of it, I used all of it. <laughs> I'm sitting there on the ball, sucking a lollipop. Um, it's traumatic. Even if it's a vaginal birth, they have to turn the baby's neck 180 degrees to clear the second shoulder. The cesarean section uses 20 to 30 pounds of axial traction. That's equivalent to taking an infant, hanging 20 pounds of weights off its ankles and holding it up by its head. If I gave you a newborn, what's the first thing you would say? Hold his head. Hold his head. It's all floppy dobby. These vertebrae aren't even completely formed yet. So could we have the first misalignment in utero? Absolutely. One of the growing portions of our practice over the last 20 years is children who are neurodivergent or have neurodevelopmental disorders. They have sensory processing issues. Why? Because this is where all the sensory, the eyes, ears, nose, throat, special senses comes through the brainstem. If this is off, they don't interpret their environment properly. They do incredible cognitively under care where their therapists say, what did you start doing for your son or daughter? So remember what I said, this talk may not be for you. So when your children first got their teeth, did you take them to the dentist? Or did you wait till they hurt? Their teeth don't hurt, they're fine. No, all the mamas, right? All the mamas, you know, make the appointment, rush them off to the, to the pediatric dentist, and they don't even keep those teeth. <laughs> but it makes sense. So why they only get one spine and it's, it's housing and, and protecting this nervous system that's running their growth and development. Why would we not check it early on? When's the best time to stake a tree? When it's young or when it's old? So this is the process, folks. Accidents and injuries throughout our life. And it doesn't have to be a, a macro trauma like a car accident. It could be this. God, we saw a 14-year-old with a reverse cervical curve yesterday. Oh. I see, we see that all the time. And three years ago, when we first evaluated her, she had a perfect curve. So it's accelerating now. How many people have ever hit their head on a door jam or the overhead in the, uh, in the, in the, in the, in the airplane? Accidents and injuries tear loose the connective tissue that once held us straight. And when that shows a tearing of the connective tissue, and that shows up as a tilting of the head, a higher or low shoulder, a twisting of the body framework, but there's no symptoms. It just leads to an abnormal movement pattern that over time leads to a progressive wear and tear. And there's still no symptoms until there's enough wear and tear where you go, ouch. And you take Advil and you rub it, something on you, you just inject it, you shoot it, and then finally you go to the orthopedic. And they take an x-ray of your, of your spine, your knees, your hips, and they go, it's arthritis. It's part of the normal aging process. <coughs> but you came to my dinner and you said, well, how old's the other knee? Mm -hmm. it, it, people don't get the same knee, the knee's done at the same time, the hip's done at the same time. When we look at a spine, five, C5, C6, and then L5S1 degenerate first because they're load bearing. So wherever the mechanical stress is, those joints are gonna wear down first. When's the best time to correct that? when it's stenotic and herniated and pinched, we can do that, no problem. But it would have been better if we got to it early. It's never too late. And so when patients come to us from their specialist, they come in with their thoracic MRI, their cervical x-ray, their lumbar MRI, and I ask them, where's the rest of your spine? 
That would be like going to the heart doctor and just, just getting the right side of your heart checked. Or going to the, the, the dentist and they only x-ray the top of your mouth on this visit. You'll never get your spine corrected by only looking at one piece of it. The surgeons and the pain management doctors look at one piece because they are just gonna find the most diseased piece and put a shot of medicine or, or fuse it or cut it or eject it or whatever they do. So, it's a three-dimensional structure. It's made to withstand gravity, which is 4,000 pounds per second. And there's one thing that, 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 you know, everybody's afraid of gluten these days. I'll tell you what you gotta be afraid of, gravity. Because <laughs> what's healthy? This or this? Everybody knows posture is a symbol of health. Journal of Neurosurgery 2017 showed that a thoracic kyphosis is the greatest predictor of length of life. Because as this collapses in, it compresses the heart, lungs, raises the blood pressure, and causes cardiothoracic strain. This is about life. This isn't about a bad back or an achy neck. And so when we do the upper cervical work, it affects the entire column, cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. And if there's nerve interference in the upper neck, it can lead to things like headaches, migraines, vertigo, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, Meniere's disease, trigeminal neuralgia, or facial pain. If there's nerve interference in your lower neck, it can affect your arms and your hands tingling in the morning. It can affect the thyroid gland. If there's nerve interference in the upper back, it can affect the heart of the lungs. If there's nerve interference in the middle of the spine, it can wrap around under the breasts. It can go in and affect functional heart or functional a lung or, or upper GI issues. If there's nerve interference in the upper lumbar spine, it can affect the spleen, kidneys, liver, gallbladder. If there's nerve interference in the lower back, it can affect the power to the legs, the bowel, bladder, reproductive system, colon, prostate. So doesn't it make sense to like go to the garage when the, when the microwave and the dishwasher and the, and, 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 and the refrigerator are all off, do you get three new appliances? Or do you go, honey, check the box? And you check the fuse box? And that's what we do all day long. We work at the box and we look which ones are tricked and we put them back in line and we restore power downhill. That's what we do. Now it's much more complex than that, but so is the iPhone and an 18 month can use it, right? So there's a lot of science underneath what I'm telling you. So we, we take care of it all. And the beautiful thing about it is it's safe enough for a baby. It's safe. There are people in our practice that have rods and bolts and screws and we can still take care of them with this technique. And so when we do these talks, we always ask a patient to share their perspective. And last year we had patient number one share his perspective and it was amazing and incredible. And if you wanted to hear Linda's story, you can go on our YouTube channel. <laughs> um, but today we have a newer patient, a very special patient. Her name is Yvette. She's not a, a public speaker, so we want to envelop her with love when she comes up to be vulnerable for a second and share her story with all of you. Yvette, come on up. Nothing I seemed to do was helping. 
even after months of physical therapy, twice, lots of ibuprofen per day, muscle relaxers, heating pads, massage guns, you name it. By now, you can only imagine what my quality of life was looking like, which also had an effect on my family. So speaking of such, my daughter, she was seeking employment and came across upper cervical, which she thought was some type of gynecological office <laughs> at first, sorry, mommy. <laughs> but she quickly learned differently and she got the job anyway. <laughs> so after some time there, she learned what she didn't know about chiropractic care and she sent me a YouTube video which I didn't even review, at least for a month, until I was clearing up my text messages. Yeah. And it was titled something like, osteoarthritis, hmm, check. Disc problems, check. Stenosis, hmm, check. And my, thoughts before wa my thought before watching it was, why would a chiropractor be talking about all the things that I'm experiencing? That was the extent of my knowledge. I thought chiropractors only crack backs. And I was in enough pain that I wouldn't have even thought to come to a chiropractor. See, you just don't know. Don't know. Don't know. All right. <laughs> anyway, I watched the video in amazement, I might add. So I called my doctor, who had already recommended me to see an ortho doctor. And I expressed my interest in this practice and was told to go for it if I thought that could help. So I did. And now, after a few months of consistent appointments, I'm standing longer. I'm strutting through airport terminals. <laughs> I'm ditching wheelchairs, scooters in the grocery stores. I'm cooking for my family, and that's huge. That's huge, by the way, because that just wasn't happening, and my husband does not like eating it all the time. But I couldn't even fathom standing to stir a pot. I'm doing yard work, like mowing the lawn. I never thought I'd be excited about that, and emotional. I got emotional when I was able to do that. Um, let's see. But the quality of my life has improved tremendously. And even my nervous system. So do I still have some pain? Sure. When I do too much. But the point is, I can do too much. <laughs> okay. So, um, oh, one other thing. Now I tell people that try to press my buttons, you're not getting on my good nerves. <laughs> So that's my story for now. And I just want to thank the work of the hands and the knowledge provided by all the doctors at Upper Cervical. And I've had the, pre the pleasure and the privilege of being treated by all of them. So this bears repeating. You don't know what you don't know. Thank you. <laughs> That's why we do what we do. And um, I will tell you that we didn't do anything different for Yvette than we did for Stephanie, who I started out this evening talking about. We just located the interference in the nervous system and we corrected it. 